Last year, I posted a video of a moon mission that I piloted using only the abort button. I made this work by automating the various sequences of the mission using cow controllers and toggling them on and off at strategic times. Overall, the mission could be piloted with a single button, but I had to press this button over 50 times to make it happen. If most of the maneuvers and attitude adjustments could be eliminated, the total number of user inputs needed could be reduced to single digits. Unfortunately, a fully automated moon mission seemed out of reach due to one issue in particular, the need for multiple forms of external feedback. The vehicle needs to be able to detect its proximity relative to the moon to know when to start the landing sequence. And once landed, it needs to be able to target and execute the return trip all autonomously. With cow controllers alone, we can only predetermine certain actions to occur at a fixed time relative to launch. To make the control sequence sensitive to external feedback, I needed to find ways to translate various environmental influences into cow controller activations. To my knowledge, the only stock part that can be used to activate a cow unit directly is another cow unit. However, a unit which is already running will stop the moment it's decoupled or destroyed. If two control loops are competing to start and stop a third controller, the starting loop will activate the third unit once the halting unit is deactivated. This will come in handy for detecting when the craft has made contact with the surface, for instance. The halting unit is attached to a small fuel tank, which is destroyed if the landing is at 10 meters per second or faster. In fact, the faster the impact, the better. Structural panels have a very high impact tolerance, and we can auto-strut them to a group of nodes while offsetting them from the central payload. This makes for a lightweight lander which can withstand a 70 meter per second impact and safely come to rest at any orientation. Still, to make the craft capable of detecting when it has reached a specific altitude above the surface, I needed to leverage another form of environmental influence. Luckily, solar panels will cease to produce electrical power at any altitude, provided the craft enters an eclipse. This sudden loss of power can be used to destroy a running cal unit through a chain reaction. If the thrust from an ion engine is holding back a piston, the flame out following an eclipse will allow the piston to point three running engines directly into a cal unit, melting it almost immediately. With this combined mechanism, we can translate a loss of direct sunlight into a cal unit activation with minimal delay between the events. I've also timed the launch so that the vehicle enters the moon's shadow about 40 to 50 kilometers above the surface. This ensures that the landing control sequence will initiate at roughly the same altitude, even though the time of reaching that altitude varies from one launch to the next. There's also another useful property that solar panels have, which is automated sun tracking. With same vessel interaction enabled for an unpowered rotor and a solar panel, we can create an automated servo which can orient other parts towards the sun. By fixing two of these together at 90 degrees, we can construct a two-axis gimbal. This ability to passively align parts of the vessel with a fixed direction in space is what ultimately makes the return to Kerbin possible. With these techniques tested and refined, I finally had everything I needed to start designing the first ever fully automated moon mission in stock KSP. And with that, I bring you the Automoon 17, a craft capable of landing a Kerbal on the moon and returning them safely to Kerbin at the touch of a button. All you need to do is max throttle, activate SAS, hit the space bar at just the right moment, and watch the craft do the rest.
At the end of the launch sequence, the vehicle is delivered directly to its final collision course with the moon. The vehicle can't autonomously target any mid-course corrections, so the lunar injection has to be targeted from launch instead. This is done by designing the launch vehicle to be as stable and consistent as possible and carefully selecting the time of launch. For a nominal launch performance, the craft is placed on a lunar injection which will impact the surface at about negative 5 degrees latitude and between 22 and 25 degrees longitude. The trip to the moon will take just over two hours, so the last action of the launch sequence is to activate a two-hour delay timer. This is just a 7,330 second long cal sequence, which is timed to start up the eclipse sensor at roughly 100 kilometers from the moon's surface. Meanwhile, the SAS autopilot will maintain the vehicle's attitude throughout the coast phase. This means that the landing burn can be targeted by assuming a fixed attitude and calibrating the thrust limiters on each group of landing engines. This, in turn, allows me to align the net thrust with the retrograde vector without the need for attitude maneuvers or hinges to redirect engines. Once the delay timer completes, the Eclipse sensor's engines are activated, along with the starting and halting cow loops. We reach lunar eclipse less than a minute later, tripping the sensor to activate the landing sequence. The Eclipse sensor assembly is jettisoned, and the main landing burn is timed to start at 20 to 30 kilometers above the surface. All 12 vector engines are set to decouple once the speed is below 50 meters per second, and the craft is allowed to fall briefly before activating the hovering engines. These engines provide a thrust to weight ratio of about one, so the craft can maintain its rate of descent and simply wait until it makes contact with the surface. The contact sensors cow loops are also activated, and these will shut down the hover engines at the moment of impact. From here, the craft's remaining speed is nullified by some good old-fashioned lithobraking. The structural panels are arranged to surround the central craft, protecting it during subsequent impacts where the vehicle's attitude is unknown. The landing sequence has a few minutes of delay built in to allow plenty of time for the craft to come to a complete stop before starting the return sequence. This is where the sun tracking solar arrays come in. First, it ejects the structural panels that are below the fairing base, and it pivots the opposing panels outward to right the vehicle. The sun is currently to the west at 45 degrees below the horizon. By pointing the return engines at the sun, the resulting thrust will be pointed east at 45 degrees above the horizon. A burn in this direction will carry the vehicle away from the surface while slowing its velocity relative to Kerbin. The return maneuver is calibrated so that the final trajectory is guaranteed to result in atmospheric re-entry. All that's left to do now 
is arm the parachutes and decouple. and then wait a few hours to get home. So that's my fully stock, fully automatic moon mission. This was probably the hardest challenge that I've ever attempted in KSP, and this thing took months to test and develop before I finally had a working model. If you want to try it out for yourself, I've made the craft file available for download. Link is in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.